Hey everyone, it's Andre. Um, just right before the podcast starts up, I uh, wanted to mention that today is Thursday, so today this morning um, Apple announced that they're going to be having an iPad event that will be going on at the end of the month, you know, October 30th. Uh, Jacob and I will definitely cover that once it happens, but you will notice that we actually talk about how this could be happening in the episode here so uh just to let you know we did not know about the event when we recorded this so uh we will talk about that more next week and then the week after when it actually happens also sorry about the audio quality in the intro coming up uh we got a new microphone but i accidentally forgot to record with that microphone so it was just using the internal microphone of my laptop so hopefully that doesn't bother you too much and then we have a great interview up coming up for you uh, and that does use better audio quality. Thanks. Hey, it's me, Jacob Petticord. And it's me, Andre Garive. And you're listening to the Hacker Slacker. We got a good episode for you today. Yeah, today we're going to go over some follow-up on some stuff we talked about last week, uh, like the portal. Um, some things we've talked about in the past, how uh, an iPad event may be imminent this month even. And uh, my co-host here, Jacob, got an Apple Watch. Uh, so we've got a lot to talk about here at the top. Uh, then we'll go over some really neat news stories um, for Uber and Lyft having their IPOs. And then some really sad news about the passing of Paul Allen. Uh, and then after that, uh, we've got this really awesome interview we did with Ben Haw, the CEO and founder of Metaplug. He's out in L.A. He's from the Valley. It's a really awesome interview, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. So here we go. Yeah, we got a packed show for you guys. So first off, I got the new Apple Watch Series 4, 40 millimeter, um, and it was a huge upgrade from my Series 0, and I'm loving it so far. Yeah, so you actually, you showed me this today in class, and I I love it already. Um, that screen is so nice. Yeah, I had to tease it for you. Um, the, the difference in the screen size, you can definitely feel it. It feels like it's the right size for my wrist. I know a lot of people favor the, the bigger watch for the bigger screen, but I really feel like this is the one that fits my wrist the best, even though it is the smaller, cheaper one. Um, and having the GPS on the watch has just been like, a huge feature for me being able to go running without my phone is definitely something that I'll I'll be appreciating combined with my AirPods. Yeah, so I'm looking at the watch right now actually. You've got it out here. Um the amount of complications you can fit on the home screen is really incredible. Yeah, so they've definitely upped the information density of the existing complications. So um, right now, the watch face I'm using is the new um, utility watch face, I think. No, the infograph modular. It's the new modular watch face. So it adds a few extra complication spaces compared to the old modular. And so I can see the time, the date, my activity, um, and then the my uh, next task to do in my task manager things, which is something we're going to have to go into in a future episode, task managers. Um, and then at the bottom, I have all this different weather stuff. So I can see the temperature um, on a little gauge, almost like a speedometer, that shows where the current temperature is. And then the gauge goes from low to high for the day's temperature. The current conditions, which is a little icon that shows right now the moon because it's a clear sky, but it would show clouds or rain if it was raining. And then something that matters way more here in Lincoln than I think anywhere else I've ever been is the wind, which is oh, actually yeah. something that's really nice to have on my watch because... Uh, if you live in Lincoln, you know that 58 and 5 mile an hour wind is a little different than if you see 58, but it's actually the legendary like 17 mile an hour winds outside <laughs> Yeah. when you really need to bundle up. But yeah, so that's all been cool. Um, just the, the bigger screen has definitely allowed them to pack a lot more data into these watches. And some people have been complaining about the looks of the watch. People are still noting that you can't do custom watch faces. But I've definitely found it a huge incremental improvement. Um, one of the interesting developments this week with the Apple Watch was there's this guy on Twitter who actually made an Apple Watch app that is essentially a bunch of custom faces. Did you see this? I did not see that. So the app is a, it lets you customize custom faces like set background color and a bunch of things that you can't set on a real Apple Watch face. And it's a type of app where it maintains its status in the foreground when you shut it off. So even though it's not a watch face, if you launch the app and then 
put your wrist down, the screen turns off, and then lift it back up, it'll still be on that app. Huh. And he hasn't gotten it through App Store View, but it was just interesting to see, like, the lengths people are going to to uh, um, get custom watch faces, and hopefully it's something that we'll see Apple implementing more of in the future. Um, I think it was Stephen Travis Smith on Twitter, if you want to look up the stuff he's doing. It's pretty cool what he does. Um, but yeah, basically, to recap, I got the uh, Series 4 40mm Nike Plus version because I liked the band that that came with, and the silver aluminum, and I've really been enjoying it so far. So I'll definitely uh, keep you updated if like my usage pattern changes, but for now it's looking like it's making the Apple Watch a bigger part of my life again. That is good to hear. Um, so the next thing we have here for follow-up is last week we talked about the Facebook Portal device, their first native hardware device. Uh, they have companies they have acquired like Oculus and other companies, but this is the first Facebook hardware device. And um, I actually watched a really interesting video from Scott Galloway of L2 Inc. He's also a professor at NYU. And I usually watch his videos to hear about uh, brand strategy, marketing, all that kind of stuff. And he was talking about how Facebook is the only company that needs to sell their always on camera with a cover because nobody really can trust Facebook. So we look at it and we say, oh, the Amazon Echo Show, it's right there. Um, it's an always on camera and nobody really bats an eye, but Facebook just automatically had to put a cover in because if it didn't, would you really trust Facebook having a camera in your house all the time? Yeah, he said it was a result of like user testing that that's one of the things users wanted was like, hey, like this Facebook thing, I really want a camera on it. And the way he phrased it was like, that's really them just saying like, oh, this is a nice product, but like I, like F you Facebook, like I, want yeah. you, I do not want you to be able to have this permission. So he saw it as like a big mark against the consumer sentiment around Facebook, which I mean, we've been talking about that on the show quite a bit. People are very down on Facebook right now, privacy wise, and probably not the ideal time for them to be launching a product that's an always on camera and micro microphone in your uh, kitchen or home no matter how cool it is. So you you honestly kind of have to feel bad for the hardware engineers that worked on this thing. Absolutely. This it, is some of the coolest hardware I've seen. Yeah, if, if they were launching this product for Apple, I think we would all be amazed and people would be talking about how revolutionary it is that you can uh, be like tracked around the room while you're FaceTiming and not have to worry about standing directly in front of a device for the first time ever. And speaking of FaceTiming, FaceTime is a thing I use. Um, if Apple had made this, I may have actually gotten it. I don't have a HomePod because it's ridiculously expensive, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure Apple would sell it for $500 if they made one of these show devices. But it's really, like, it, it, it's such a great ecosystem for Apple. Facebook doesn't have an ecosystem. Yep. So when you, all you have is security breaches and no eco ecosystem, it's very difficult to trust you with always-on devices in my home. Yeah, as a uh, as a tech person, you kind of hate to see cool tech go to waste like this, but I'm sure someone else will pick it up. I'm sure this sounds like some feature that Google would love to implement. Uh, oh, I'm absolutely some machine sure learning tracking. Be. So, it I I would not be surprised to see it pop up in maybe the next Echo Show or something like that. Yep, I I do not predict that this device is going to sell incredibly well unless there's some other country that uses FaceTime video more that I'm not thinking of, but. If I had to guess, we probably won't hear a lot about the the portal. Uh, yeah. After the next couple. Interestingly, weeks. I have been getting a lot of Hulu ads about it. Um, so they're they're marketing it very heavily. So. Yeah, I guess if there's one thing Facebook knows, it's online ads. So maybe they'll be able to get some yeah. sales out of that. All right. So um, you're actually using an iPad right now. Want to talk about the imminent event coming yeah. up? Yeah. So this is something that I think me and Andre are both excited and afraid of. Um, we've talked in the past on previous shows that. Um, we both believe that there will be an iPad event before the end of this year, and this week especially, the tech rumor mill has kind of been solidifying around that idea, and that, so next week, I believe, is when the iPhone XR pre-order opens, and then the week after that is when they ship. So that's when a lot of the talk around that device is going to be happening, and then people think the following week is probably when Apple will have their iPad Pro event, which... We're expecting to see new iPad Pros, and there's a lot going on in the the uh, professional tablet industry in the last week even that we think is probably going to have some effects on what Apple releases. So you see things, obviously the, the Surface line has had a lot of success, 
and they have a trackpad. The Google Pixel just launched. Um, it's a really great product, and it also has a trackpad. So we're seeing Apple's competitors use these interfaces that have um, trackpads and detachable keyboards and a great touchscreen experience, which is something that iOS does not have right now. So one thing that I am personally horrified of is the idea that in a couple of weeks, Apple's going to launch this new iPad with a new, maybe a trackpad, new interface for iOS, something that just completely blows away the current experience out of the water, and I'm stuck here with this I new iPad that I love and I bought a few months ago. Um, but I think this is one of the first times that I'm genuinely pretty scared of Apple doing something revolutionary. Yeah, um, I've also heard a lot of rumors saying that they'll release the next AirPods, that they were delayed from the iPhone event, because if you look at the beginning of the iPhone event in their intro video, the Incredibles theme, um, she's actually running through water, um, kind of signaling that the next AirPods, she has her AirPods in and um, her Apple Watch connected, uh, and it kind of signals, oh hey, uh, these next AirPods are coming as well, they'll be more water resistant. She does say, hey Siri, to the, um, gotta make sure. Every time I do that, my phone activates. Um, uh, but she she uses that feature to activate her AirPods, um, which is not currently supported. So I will be really interested to see, maybe we'll get those wireless charging AirPods, um, or the AirPod case, rather, and uh, new upgraded AirPods. Yeah, we definitely, we picked up on that when we watched that video that we thought that that's something that was going to happen. It'll be interesting to see if they're launched at an iPad event which doesn't make as much sense as doing it at the iPhone event, but if there's some hardware delay, I could see that just like being unavoidable. Um, I, people are also expecting to see new Macs, which isn't quite as interesting to me personally, but it's definitely time for the Mac line to get a refresh. Hopefully they do something cool with the, the regular MacBook, the 11 and 12 inch model. Um, and then other than that, I really doubt we will be seeing air power. I bet that's just going to be something that's... Yeah, I think that might be dead. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be anything that's seen, but whenever that event gets announced, we'll definitely be talking about it here, and we'll definitely be talking about what they announce at the event when it happens, so stay tuned for that. Absolutely. So do you want to talk us through Uber and Lyft in 2019? Yeah, so two of the biggest like uh, companies in the recent years to launch have been Uber and Lyft. Uh, you probably mostly know them for ride sharing um, and something that's been crazy about them is the amount of growth Uber especially has had um, and in 2019 they are both going to do their initial public offering where they go for sale um, on the public markets become public companies which is a huge deal for tech companies that's kind of like making the big leagues which these companies both already have but one of the crazy things is that Uber is projected to be evaluated at around $120 billion. And Lyft, something that you often think like, oh, should I take Uber or Lyft? Lyft is projected to be uh, um, evaluated at around $15 billion. So almost a, a tenth of what Uber is, which is crazy. And it just goes to show how much Uber's other um, products that Lyft doesn't also have drive its uh, market price. So those things include Uber Eats, which... Um, analysts value that alone as $20 billion, which is more than the value of Lyft. And then they're also just trying to become the future of transportation company more than just the ride hailing co company. So this is something that I don't know if we would be seeing an evaluation this high if it wasn't for the executive leadership change that happened recently. Um, and I mean, you saw the new CEO talk. He's definitely changed the vibe around Uber. Absolutely. When I saw Khosrow Shahi talk while I was in San Francisco, you could really tell that he was really going for a different atmosphere for the future of Uber. And uh, I think that's really going to help them in the long run. Uh, when you IPO, you really go out into the world and say, we are a well-established professional company. And you can't have people like Kalanick in the head of those kind of companies. You need more experienced people. Khosrow Shahi had worked in several Fortune 500 companies as an executive before this. He's very much ready for this, and he's ready to take Uber into their future. Yeah, so as Uber is maturing, the future uh, that they see themselves as being like the transportation company, uh, one of the big things that is getting them there and away from just ride sharing is that they acquired a company called Jump. Uh, they're pretty popular for their uh, jump bikes. You'll see a lot of these stations in the downtowns of a lot of cities where 
you take bikes from one rack to another. Um, but this makes me think of the latest transportation trend this year, the electric scooters that we've been seeing. I know Bird is valued at around $20 billion itself. There are these companies that uh, just have decentralized scooters in the city. It's been really cool to see. We have them in Kansas City. A lot of the bigger cities have actually started booting them out. Like I was in Seattle last weekend and you didn't see any uh, scooters there, whereas they're just kind of littered downtown in Kansas City. And they've definitely started out just being littered in like all the major cities. But I mean, these companies, uh, for those who don't know the way they work is you just find these scooters laying around the city. You can see their locations in the app. You can uh, activate them with the app, kind of like Uber. You uh, get in the app and then you can turn them on. You can ride around and then uh, when you're done, you just say, I'm done. The scooter locks back up and then eventually these drivers who are also kind of gig economy people come around and pick up the scooters and they get paid to charge them and throw them back out on the street. So the crazy thing about that is there's no bike rack like Jump has. It's just kind of um, really going for that last mile infrastructure almost in these cities, which has been cool to watch and we'll see how that industry matures. Um, if eventually it is some viable thing, which I feel like the market's so big right now that um, something has to come of this. So it'll be cool to watch that industry develop and see how Uber probably will end up taking advantage of that as well. All right. So our next story on a little bit darker note, um, Microsoft co-founder, uh, billionaire, uh, philanthropist, and Pacific Northwest sports legend Paul Allen died on uh, October 15th, um, just a couple of days ago, he uh, was great friends with Bill Gates since Bill Gates was in seventh grade. We'll link this, uh, this letter from Bill Gates uh, called What I Loved About Paul Allen um, in the show notes. But basically, Bill Gates shows us how integral Paul Allen was to the creating of Microsoft and modern technology as we know it. So I think um, a lot of people, when they think Microsoft, they think Bill Gates. But Paul Allen was there the whole time. He got Bill Gates to start the company with him. It wasn't just Bill Gates, but we kind of look at Bill Gates as the head guy, um, the true founder. But uh, Paul Allen, as a technologist, was just as important. And one interesting thing, um, as a big sports fan myself, he was the owner of the uh, the Seattle Seahawks and the Portland Trailblazers. So he owned a couple of Pacific Northwest sports teams. He really helped revitalize the scene there um, where not too many sports teams were having much success. And he, he really made it uh, possible for people to be successful there. And now they have some of the greatest fan bases uh, in America, up in Seattle and Portland. So he will be very dearly missed in the technology community in the philanthropy community and within the sporting community um and so we just kind of wanted to pay our respects to him as a great technologist yeah i uh personally don't didn't know too much about paul allen um and this past week when the news broke that he was dead i was actually in San or in seattle um at a tech company and i just visited microsoft earlier that day so i'd actually heard a lot about paul allen's influences on the city you know um the owner of a Super Bowl winning franchise, the uh, he funded a lot of buildings on the University of Washington's campus. And when we talk about um, the, ne the necessity of tech talent in these cities, a lot of that comes from people like Paul Allen who go and they donate these buildings to computer science departments. I think that they mentioned that there was one building called the Paul Allen Building on University of Washington's campus and another one going up with the same name because that's just how big of donors these guys are. Um, so I don't know much about Paul Allen, but it was definitely a, a somber moment in Seattle when all the people there realized it. And I definitely have a lot of respect for everything that uh, he's been able to build and the impact that he's had with his philanthropy. Yeah. Rest in peace, Paul. Okay, so now we'll move on to the interview we did with Ben Haw, founder and CEO of Metal Plug. Uh, I think you guys will really enjoy it. So here we go. Hey, we're here with Hacker Slacker's first ever interview guest, Ben Ha, coming all the way from uh, Los Angeles. Ben, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Appreciate it for inviting me on, on your podcast. 
Yeah, so me and Ben actually met last spring at the Y Combinator Hackathon, um, and I just thought he seemed like a really cool guy. He's uh, been working on a lot of cool stuff, so I figured I'd get him on the podcast. Ben, you want to give the listeners a little introduction? Yeah, so a little background about me. I am the CEO of Metaplug, um, and what we do at Metaplug is we're a music tech company, and we basically develop technology that locates where fans live for artists. And we do a bunch of stuff with that data. So we do a lot of different consulting gigs, a lot of different uh, record labels. Um, we help plan shows and we're still really exploring how we can use this data. But uh, we're, we're mainly kind of like consulting right now. But eventually it's going to be developed into a full on vertical product that can be used for like one per, one job in the industry. So um, when I was hearing you pitch this back in the spring, the big sell was kind of cutting out the middlemen in the music industry. Do you want to talk a little bit about that uh, advantage of your your business? Yeah. So um, music, the way the industry works relies all on relationships. So everything you do in the music industry is through business and through relations. Um, so basically there's middlemen everywhere for every single job. Um, and what we found is a lot of this stuff can easily be bypassed if people had more of two things. First of all, education. If people were smarter, had more access to data, they would be able to pursue different um, moves and plays without, you know, without going through somebody else. Additionally, we've noticed that obviously with the internet, you can also bypass a lot of communication as well. So here at Metaplug, we're really trying to um, hone in on the data and on the education part to allow people to be more independent and free from middlemen. So it's about kind of presenting the the data that's out there on the internet now in ways that makes these like older jobs where people are just kind of taking a cut and like being a tax on the artists and the venues, making those types of people obsolete. Yes, exactly. Um, with, okay, so like, when Spotify came out and all these streaming companies came out, right? That that actually the transition from 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 CD sales over to streams that that has revolutionized the industry. Everything's online now, and I can't really understate how how pivotal that moment was. Like we literally saw labels like like laying off like a third of their staff, right? Um, and even today, they haven't really hired everybody back. But today, um, the labels have. Um, figured out how to monetize streaming um, and streaming has become a really integral part and it's pretty much everything now and that's all online so all this past data that all these companies are looking at or all these artists are looking at these weren't these these data points are not updated with how music is currently being consumed today which is digitally um, and that's what we're trying to play. We're, we're trying to play it. We, we really believe there's a there's a new data point out there, and uh, that's what we're trying to find. So are you able to take the like location of listens on Spotify and kind of factor that into where you think an artist would like be able to fill a venue? Yeah, so basically one of our – so I, 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 let, me, let me like walk you through some case studies that we do. So our product right now – um, helps with so many jobs throughout the industry. Um, we've our product is being used by ANRs, it's being used by agencies, it's being used by management companies, obviously managers, it's being used by promoters and individual artists themselves. And all of these roles have very different jobs. For example, for the ANR, we're actually working with an ANR at Columbia, and we're actually working on helping her. What's an ANR again? Sorry. So an A and R is artist and repertoire. So it's called essentially a scout for the music industry. Okay. So all the jobs in the music industry, again, because there's so many middlemen, most of the jobs in the industry doesn't have like a clear cut rubric on what you do. For example, like a manager handles a lot of business stuff, right, for the artist, but also sometimes puts in their creative inputs into how the artist makes their music. Um, an A and R doesn't just sign the artist, but it's also responsible for connecting the artist with like who they should work with, like producers and features and stuff like that and studio sessions. But at the same time, that's kind of what the manager does as, as well, except the A&R works with the label and the manager's independent. Okay. So like which types, which types of roles does Metaplug like help with? So Metaplug helps with 
that's that's what we found is that Metaplug has that brings value to pretty much every single role. What we're trying to do is to focus on what role it brings the most value to, and then develop a product around that. So um, with A and R's, for example, um, their biggest thing that we can help them with is signing an artist and and tracking their growth. So there's this artist that Columbia is thinking about signing. They're not sure um, if she can have a tour or not. So they came to us. We ran a uh, heat map or a scan, and we basically, you know, collected her data and we found out where her fans lived, and we displayed it on a map, and we found out that she can do a very she has a very strong markets in the East Coast and kind of in the Southwest or Southeast and and kind of through Texas and stuff like that. And so she could do a tour and she, she was a signable artist. So, so, you know, so, so if there's an artist like her with that data, obviously that's really important for Columbia, who's the one investing in the artist. So that that's very important. Yeah, that's awesome. You can kind of prove that they have exactly. followings in places and say like, Oh, so that they're viable for this type of a tour and not like have them waste a bunch of times in cities where they might not be as well known. Yes. And in a similar way, an agent needs that information as well because they don't, they, they, an agent is responsible for booking the artist, right? So they need to know where to book the artist. They need to know how to price the artist. So what we actually do with our data is our data allows us the ability to actually predict ticket sales um, and um, in a certain like radius and like, like, let's say like a 50 mile area within a city. Um, and I think that's really important because once we continue developing that feature um that can be used in a much bigger sense so we're looking into merchandising and cross brand promotion so if we can predict how many people can come out to shows we could predict how many people will buy merchandising and as we know merchandising is becoming way more important for artist revenue now one of the things that really blew me away about you and your team at the hackathon was how you were kind of just like learning quickly and implementing technologies that you didn't have a lot of like previous experience with like when i was there you guys were developing machine learning models and all this stuff that i'm sure is like totally informing all the work that you do today can you maybe talk about a little bit about your process like how long ago you started and all the different stuff you've had to pick up yeah for sure um so just off the bat, we added a phenomenal developer to our team. Shout out to Arian. Um, he's actually doing conducting research at Stanford as well as leading our machine learning algorithms and models within our tech stack. Um, anyways, when we first started um, out Metaplug, I built the original algorithm myself for a computer science class in high school. Um, and I, I was in a web development course, and that was our final project. So I, that's what I did. Because um, okay, so a little background about me: I was already working in the music industry. I started working in the music industry when I was a junior in high school. Um, this class was taken a senior in high school, and back then we were mainly just developing websites um, for celebrities. So we started off with Re Revenge X Storm. My partner got got ASAP Rocky. My partner is Alex Short, by the way. Um, he's our CTO. And then we started doing a bunch of getting a lot of contract work. So our name started being put in the industry. Then we met with this local artist group in, in the Bay Area called Lucid Monday, who we work with very, very closely. So yeah, we, we worked we worked with Lucid Monday in Santa Cruz, or sorry, not in Santa Cruz. Um, it, they're, they're from the Bay, but we helped them throw a show in Santa Cruz actually with, with our algorithm. But anyways, so, so that's how we got into the industry. That's how we got our foot in the industry and we started seeing these problems. And that's what one of my friends uh, wanted to throw a show in Canada, like he was working with promoters in Canada. And these promoters were interested in how to market towards um, and target like individual Instagram accounts that like follow the artists that live in a certain city. And that's what started the ball rolling for Metal Plug. So they actually, their request actually allowed us to find and discover this completely new like data source. And that's what I started building um, in my senior class. Yeah. I mean, cause I always find out about concerts just because like, Oh, some other friend mentioned it and otherwise I would have missed it. But I feel like people should be able to use like the data that Spotify has on me to know like, Oh, like maybe show them an Instagram ad that Brock Hampton's going to be in Kansas city next week. And then like in that way, like they can kind of activate a lot more of their fan base with like highly targeted ads. Yeah. Because the thing is um, with music, music, 
marketing music at the end of the day, it's, it's all about word on the street, right? Like word on the mouth, like what your friends are listening to is what you listen to. Kind of like, yeah, that's the kind of general, like, like role. And with shows, right, that's a totally like geographical thing, right? That's a localized thing. Um, and all the numbers that you see today online and that, that these companies are looking at, they're all very global and big numbers. For example, like 2 million followers on Spotify or, or stream, uh, streamings on Spotify per month. Like, okay, so they're very popular, but, you know, it's not specific enough. And that's because, like, yeah, the internet is just a whole world. Like, it's, a, it's like a worldwide thing, you know? It's a global, it's a global reach, and we're, we're really trying to localize it. So how long has, like, Metaplug been a thing? How long have you been working on it? Um, we've been working on the algorithm and, like, the, conceptually, Metaplug has been around since last September. And, but that metal plug was very, very different than what it is today. Yeah. However, the company and the team that I have that's really behind metal plug, like the core team, me and Alex, we started a company previously before that, like a year and a half before. So like two and a half years. So technically it's like two and a half years and it works almost three years now. But metal plug specifically as the project, which is now the main thing, the main product um, has been about a year. I feel like that's a, a pretty common path to like success that a lot of startups go through is that they start out consulting and then eventually they find some niche, um, which I mean, with you guys is like these uh, people at the records and then they figure out a product that they can serve to that niche and then kind of pivot away from consulting. Is that what you guys are trying to do? Actually, yeah, that's exactly 100% what we're doing right now and what we did in the past. In fact, I would say that consulting – is so valuable for us because it allows us to network, understand their problems, and then develop a product around it. Um, and like the first product and first company that like me and Alex started is called Terra Labs, and we developed a product called Carrot, which is for the cannabis industry. And essentially, that was a product that plugged into the headphone jack of your phone that could measure all the soil data, so you can get pH, moisture, nitrates, right? Um, and we were marketing it towards the cannabis industry, which is how we actually developed a lot of um, relationships in the rap, in the hip hop and um, rap industry. Yeah, so that that allowed us to develop a lot of contacts. And you know, we don't, we don't, we weren't working in the music industry then, but we were just like hanging out with them and just like talking to them, you know. And like low key, like I'm gonna be honest, like in in order to like work in the music industry, you don't need a college degree. Um, and they just started asking us a lot of questions and, you know, low key, like I was, I, we were advising before we even programmed tools. Like I was, I was just answering questions for these artists, like basic business questions, just from my experience running the business in the past. Like, you know, like we had a tech, a business background and a tech background. And that was something that, you know, gave us a different perspective when they came to ask us questions. It was interesting to see like your guys' path into where you are now. Um, and hopefully it leads to you guys developing like a solid project or a solid product that will have some pretty high growth yeah. pretty soon here. Yeah, I think that's actually – so very important lesson here. What we learned with Carrot's dead. So Carrot never – like it failed. I mean, it's, it was probably like – it's my first big failure. Um, and I would say like Metaplug is my rebound. Um, and it could be – it could fail as well, but like I've gone really far with it. But the biggest difference of how I approach Carrot versus how I approach Metaplug was Metaplug, we talk so much to our customers and our users. We're always talking and we're always iterating. Carrot was a hardware product, but we also weren't talking to our users and our customers as much. I think that's really, really important if anybody's trying to build a business out there is that you need to talk to your customers, your users um, on like, I pretty much talk to them on a daily basis. Um, and when I mean customers and users, they're not even like paying customers or users. Like you should consider potential customers like leads as users as well. Just keep asking people who might be interested. What are their problems? It's really important to like ask what are their problems? Like I wouldn't honestly, like I don't really pitch Metaplug. I just ask what are their problems? And then we, we we're like, okay, um, this is how we can help. And that's how, that's what I found been very productive in finding out solutions to actually fix these problems. Yeah, no, I think that is the perfect advice. I think there's a lot of people that need to hear that. I know me personally, a year ago, the project I was working on, we just kind of 
made a lot of assumptions and didn't validate them enough with the users and it just ended up wasting a ton of our time and ended up bringing like us to create a product that was just not viable at all in the market so i think a lot of young people especially need to hear that and not just say like oh this is something like my entrepreneurship professor professor says i need to go talk to users it's actually like extremely necessary if you're ever going to build a a product that's ever going to reach product market fit i think yeah i completely agree with you i I would even stress that before you even build your product you should be talking to people so that's what we did like we spent so the first between september till till the end of december so beginning of january we didn't code anything at all that was just talking to people and constantly like we sent like ten thousand emails via like like downloading like emails from from SoundCloud bios and just sending out emails just to, you know testing out different ideas right yeah and even after you went through that period you didn't go straight into building like a one single use case product you went into consulting and then further defining like your customers needs which i think is like a super smart way to go about building a company and we were about to actually build a product but what we found was that what what really struck us is that we actually develop a new data so that that's kind of like our edge as well as a as an analytics company or like as the core product the core technology we, we built developed new analytics that like gave us also the ability to like develop it into and incorporate into whatever product we, we want to incorporate it into so so that was that was really nice that's that's something that that isn't really um given to to companies that that are trying to solve like, for example, a smart toothbrush or something, right? Like you don't like there's a toothbrush only has so many use cases. You, you kind of see what I'm saying? Yeah. You built a, a solution, but a solution that solved like a lot of different types of problems. Yeah. So like, that's also another thing. Like, like carrot, for example, um, I mean, I guess the core technology could have been used for a different use case, but at the end of the day, it still would have been a sensor, like no matter what, but with, Metaplug's data that we're collecting, we could do a lot of, we could build a lot of different products. So one of the first products that we wanted to build right away was actually a tool that automatically planned out a show for you. What we found out is that wasn't very viable because of two things. One is the industry isn't ready for that yet. We you need because remember the industry relies everything on relationships. So converting everything over to an online platform would not work, especially not right away. Maybe in the future, but not right now. Second of all, we we found that there were other music tech companies in the space that weren't doing exactly that, but had the potential to easily like come in and do a better job of it. So that's another thing that we wanted to avoid was competition. Yeah, I think a, a good way to, to put what we've been talking about is that you guys definitely gave yourself plenty of room to pivot. Exactly, yeah, which I would also come with a warning was... The, the, I would say that's one of our biggest problems right now is it's really nice having the comfort of being able to pivot. At the same time, it's not so nice not exactly knowing what a clear direction or what clear product that, that you're going to develop in like a year or so. Yeah. I mean, hopefully you just keep listening to your customers and eventually you are, uh, you're right where you want to be. Exactly. Uh, so one of the things that we talk about a lot when we're talking about early stage technology companies, uh, tech firms, startups, things like that, is the pivot. Uh, we just mentioned it. But two two things that I think kind of get left out a lot when we talk about these same kind of companies are zooming in and zooming out. When, when you realize, oh, hey, my scope is way out of whack. I'm building to handle the data of the entire federal government. I only need to be, maybe you're, you're looking through arrest warrants uh, for your county. Uh, which is going to be much smaller data. Um, so what have you kind of learned about scope in your projects so far? So what we actually found right away is that the music scope is very, very small. So that's why like, I kind of brought up like brand engagement um, um, in, the, in the introduction, is the music industry, no matter how many, like, honestly, right now I – our connections and our leads, we're pretty much talking to every single company in the music industry at this moment. Or like we have, we're somehow affiliated with every, with, 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 with like, for example, like I'm working with Columbia Records that's owned by Sony, right? Like there's only three major labels really in the industry. They own everything like Live Nation. The whole industry is a monopoly. That's the thing. So we're really only selling to like three customers. 
So once we um, establish a really, really strong relationship with these customers, what we plan to do is to broaden our scope and to engage third-party brands. Like, for example, I'm a student at LMU, so we're working on a potential partnership where Metaplug will help consult for LMU and actually throw an event here with an artist. Yeah, that's crazy that you guys have achieved, like, um, you're, you've grown your network that big in such little time. So how did you, how did you go about doing that? Um, as a, as a young founder, was it, was it some, some mentors or I know you, you said you received, uh, a, a, a grant from, it was some. Yeah. fifteen seventeen. Some, yeah. T- you want to talk about that a little bit? Wow. Yeah. So, wow. This is like three years of work. So <laughs> this is crazy. Um, I don't really know where to start with this. Started off originally with Carrot after we, de- so we actually developed Carrot at a hackathon where we won and we won this when we were like maybe like late sophomores, sophomores who so were like really young in high school and we were just excited. Like we won like $3,000. Oh my God, this could become such a successful company, right? Cause we just won money. It was, it's not like that was such a, that was, a, that was a big mistake too, by the way. Um, yeah, a hardware company needs a little bit more than three thousand dollars to get going for sure. Also, like if you develop something at a hackathon, it probably won't become a business. Yeah, I mean maybe you discover like an interesting piece of technology that's part of a business, but usually you're not thinking about the customer and you're not doing like all the proper things you need to do. Exactly. So that's like a mistake that we made very very early on. But it did give me the tools and the experience to start off my network. I met our first advisor, David Litwalk, through AngelList. I sent him a message on AngelList asking if we can connect. I told him that – so he was part of First Robotics. I dabbled in a little bit of robotics in high school. wasn't super involved, but that allowed me to have the meeting. So I had the meeting um, with David, and he connected me with a lot of the Silicon Valley people, so like Danielle at 1517. Um, I met with several like cannabis incubators and that's how we got like, we start, we started like networking with the Valley people. Um, also I live in Silicon Valley. I went to uh, Bellarmine um, and it's a pretty like uh, well-known high school in the Valley. So there was a lot of like Silicon Valley um, techies um, whose parents went to that school. So I also, some of them took, quite a bit of interest in me and were, uh, and would talk to me. So I uh, was able to like get the Valley network from there. Yeah. As kids from, uh, as kids from Kansas and Nebraska, it's a, it's a little, makes us a little je- jealous here and stuff like that. Absolutely. Not too many, uh, not too many Silicon Valley parents at my school. <laughs> yeah. 100%. No, because like for music, what I did was, okay, I knew Julius or he's the guy at Lucid Monday and he, he was re networking in LA. So I got some contacts through him. Um, and then also I went to make school, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, right? I've actually never heard of make school. Um, it's, uh, it's a really great program. I love them. I love the people there. Um, they're basically a startup that is developing a totally new system of college. And basically you go in there and you, get a comp sci, a BS now in comp sci, um, in two years. And it's really good. Um, if anybody's really entrepreneurial into development and don't want, really believe in like our current system of education today, I have a lot of criticisms to today's educational system. That's like for a totally different talk, but, um, definitely go check out make school. Um, so but, is it something that you did during high school? Yeah. It was something, it was a summer camp. They have a summer camp and then it's also like a two-year college program, okay. which I actually almost did this year and I could kind of go in like why I didn't, but um, uh, we, we could talk about that later. But basically I met Nikolai at Make School and he was a developer from LA that was like already partying with like, I guess like the Kardashians type people. So um, like, so like literally he was telling me like, I forget, like maybe like week, like second month of me being there he's telling me about a party with like ariel winter was there and stuff like that so like he was in it already you know what i mean so like a lot of it's like also luck like serendipity as well but it's like you're putting yourself in the situation to allow those opportunities to be presented to you yeah no i mean definitely networking is super important and i bet doubly so in the music industry yeah so i kind of got like a slight foot in the music industry then but it didn't really take off until this summer 
um, we got we saved up, we bootstrapped the company. We actually were able to even like get an office and and this is when things took off was really about like four months ago is when we had this office. We were working full time over the summer. I probably sent out personally sent out like at least two thousand emails over the course of like a month and a half. Literally blind emails to executives at labels and they were responding. So I was getting meetings and phone calls with like um with these top labels and these top agencies. And like, I couldn't really believe it. They're responding to the blind emails. So that, that worked, but my network wasn't really strong until I actually came to LMU to LA and I started meeting these people. So when I came to LA, that was like crazy. Like that's when I'm, I, I'm still meeting people left and right. Like, it's just crazy. Once you're in the area, when, when you're in the area and you meet people, it's a totally different game especially in the music industry where people don't really trust phone calls. People don't trust like Skype, like everything's like face to face. You know what I mean? Yeah. Go to where the customers are. Exactly. Um, and actually that's what, that's actually like another really good advice is go live where your customers live. Um, that's what Airbnb did. Yeah. So, um, one thing you did is you, you combined tech and music, um, as a, as an, uh, a student in computer science and a musician myself, I'm very interested in kind of the combination of all of those things. And so you you kind of went from the tech to where all the music and the entertainment is by going from uh, the Bay to LA. Uh, has that really impacted the connections you've made in uh, entertainment rather than tech? Yes, my connections have gotten really strong in entertainment. I'm like, so actually coming because you're a musician um i didn't really understand the importance of like the studio until i came to la so i thought the studio was just kind of a place where like artists recorded music but it's basically like a clubhouse you know it's like where people in your network come and talk about future ideas and that's where a lot of the networking comes from so just being in la and being at the studios that has made a tremendous impact i would say like one of the biggest impacts to to the network so can you talk about what it's like being a young entrepreneur as a CEO of a company that is dealing with these huge executives at huge record labels? Like, what do you have to overcome internally to get yourself to say, okay, let's go talk to this executive at Columbia? Yeah, the dynamics of that relationship must be pretty unique. Yeah, it is crazy. Um, I'm actually going to have a meeting with um, this guy who sounds kind of big um, next week. And he doesn't really know I'm a student in college. I think he, I don't think he's aware of that. <laughs> I try to keep that on the download as much as possible. Um, just don't really like to talk about it like that. I'm a student or anything. I do plan to drop out next year. I basically went to college just to see what a first year was like. Really? That's okay. That's an interesting thing to talk about. What makes you, so you're, you think you're just going to drop out and do Metaplug full time probably? Yeah. Or yeah, at least take a gap year. Like definitely it would be worth it to take a year, a full year of working full time. 100%. Yeah. So are you guys seeing the types of like revenue that supports that already? Or are you expecting to grow that over the next year? Um, yeah. So we definitely see a lot of future revenue coming in as well as we're starting to see um, current revenue as well. Like we don't have crazy amounts of revenue, but we're going to start seeing um, um, exponential growth very soon. Yeah. Lots of stuff in the works. Yes. Like about to execute very soon. That's a, uh, that's always exciting. So um, one of the, the, is it the 1648 fund? Is that what it's called? No, it's called the 1517. Okay. So the, the 1517 fund was something that definitely interested me and might interest like the younger listeners in our audience. If you want to give a little intro about that, that seemed like one of the yeah. things that you were involved in. I wish I was honestly looking back. I wish I was more like active in that community, but I owe so much to them. Um, it's just, um, so the 1517 was started by Peter Thiel. Um, the Teal Fellowship, and it's like kind of like an extension of that. Um, so they're all they're very countercultural, um, and it really their mission is all about like our education system and how it doesn't really work. Yeah, I all. remember after you uh, introduced them to me, I looked them up, and it was kind of like their whole purpose is to be a grant so that students have the option to kind of like drop out and not go to college and pursue their uh their ideas full time which i thought was really really interesting exactly um so 
they really inspired me and they gave me a lot of they really gave me the foundation for my business philosophies today. Yeah, and they probably also gave you like enough freedom to kind of be confident that you can pursue a lot of this stuff on your own, like as a student. Yeah, no, big time. And it was a support group, and it was a network, and it was it's awesome. Like, yeah, I I I, I really like that group, the fifteen seventeen group. Uh, do you have anything else um, that you found super interesting along the way? Any advice you have for young entrepreneurs? Yeah, um, shoot. I, I would say the biggest takeaway would definitely be um, if I had to summarize like three rules or like three like points that I would definitely focus on is number one is talking to your users. Number two is don't focus on how to scale. And then number three is um, a user network. User, your network is very important. Um, and like I know everybody says that, like, you know, to very, very, very like cliche. Your network is your net worth, but that is like so true. Yeah, I think those are some really solid points of advice. Um, I can actually talk more about networking. I feel like I didn't really go into that. I, I would say networking is one of my strongest talents, which is kind of like why we're we're here. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned you you did a lot of cold uh, cold emailing to a lot of these executives. Do you have any advice on how to get responses from those emails? Yeah. Um, so every, so number one thing I had to overcome was confidence. Um, I feel like with me, like I have the ability to be very confident and then when something bad happens, my confidence gets struck down and like, I'm kind of in like this down like cycle for like a couple of weeks and then I'll become really confident again and then something bad will happen and so on. So like that ebb and flow, what I've found that was very important for me to overcome was to be st- stable about it and always you know, be confident because you're going to hear a lot of no's like, um, and get rejected a lot. Um, so I would say just perseverance and, um, and, and yeah, that, that, that really helps with emails. Um, also big thing that I forgot to mention was cold calls. We were cold calling people as well. And that was really, really, really helpful because, you know, one f- cold call ended up becoming like a 57 minute phone call where we learned so much or like some strategic partnership came out of it. You know, you just never know cold calls. Yeah. That's definitely putting in the work in a big way. I feel like just uh, randomly calling people that takes a lot of, a lot of confidence and some good salesmanship. If you're going to get anything out of it. I would definitely um, good resource to look out for sales is Steli.io. Um, he runs a YC actually back company called close. IO, great company. He's a, he runs a YouTube channel. So many good sales tips. Highly recommend it. Um, and that's kind of like where I kind of got like my base understanding from sales. Obviously, uh, I'm, I'm a high school student or when, when I was doing this. So like there's no other resources but YouTube. Um, and then also I had some personal connections that were sales managers already. So I would ask them if I had any difficult questions, as well as our advisors like David Litwak, for example. Um, he, he he started his own company already. So like we would ask our network for help. But a lot of the, the ground, like basic like sales techniques, um, I watched uh, Steli's YouTube videos. I thought they were pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, our listeners should notice like just how many people you've name dropped throughout this conversation, not in like a in a braggy way, but in a, like, that's just what it takes to kind of make it, especially in your industry and like, not to be discouraged because you're young, like, especially because you're young, people want to help you out, you know? It, it's really like, people don't under, like, I did not get here by myself. Like, there are so many people, um, I, I, I don't, so honestly, some of them, like, you just don't talk to anymore, um, and, but you know, I've, I've met so many people um, and that's changed everything. And starting early is everything because, you know, if you, st- if, if you're like, if you're like under, you know, if you start before you graduate college, you're ahead of the game already because you're also in competition with your peers. So you got to do what your peers aren't doing. Yep. I definitely, definitely found the same thing. I tried to start early in high school, got my way into like a development job um, before I went to college, which definitely put me in a way better position on college applications and has given me a solid base to be a good developer now. And now that it's kind of internship time, it's all about networking if you're trying to get into the, into the big companies. So what you said about, what you said about confidence, that's definitely something I can relate to because with all this like cold emailing I've been doing, just trying to 
get my foot in the door at a lot of places. There's always that anxiety when you get that reply email when you don't know which way it's going to go because you never want to see that reaction where people are just like, why are you wasting my time? But I feel like a lot of that is overcome with just like uh, just practice and continuing to do it because you realize that most people really do just want to help. And even if you get rejected, like it, it never feels too bad. Like uh, there's the worst case scenario isn't as bad as you think it is in your head. Also, a big thing is never take like a maybe for an answer. Even when you're like doing like these job prospect, like job prospective emails, I would keep emailing these people. They're not responding to you. Like maybe wait two days and another email. If they don't email you back, maybe wait another day. And I'll send like three or four emails until they don't reply, or usually they'll they'll respond on the second or third email, yes or no. And that's how we actually almost made our first sale. They decided not to take us. Um, our first, um, our first no, which I would say is a huge accomplishment when doing a sale, um, <laughs> came from CAA, um, where I sent the agent um, three follow ups, and then when I was on a phone call with him, he was like, "Yeah, I honestly got on his phone call with you because I've never seen somebody follow up on me before." And that's really important, you know. So a lot of people, they, you're just not important enough, and they don't want see that it's worth their time to talk to you but if you follow up with them it'll make it really relevant it'll make it like you know it'll make you seem like you're serious all right so i think that's uh, all we got for the interview but thanks for talking with us behind the scenes there are a lot of technical glitches we had some false starts so thanks for sticking with us through all that and being our first interviewee i yeah, think it no went problem. really well um is there anything you want to promote for our listeners um honestly like just summarize like a lot of my like ideas and like I'm still learning and everything, but like what, where I got those ideas from were uh, honestly, a lot of it came from 1517. I'll definitely check out 1517 blogs. If you want to like learn more about like, kind of what I talked about, but yeah, it's like they're on medium and everything. So what's a, what's a good place for people to find you at a Twitter or LinkedIn? Um, yeah, you can just hit me up on my Twitter is underscore Benjamin Ha or my Instagram. Feel free to shoot me a DM. That's also underscore Benjamin Ha. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll definitely take them. All right. Well, it was great to talk to you again, Ben. Uh, hopefully, we'll talk again soon. Thanks for being yeah, on the man, show. Yeah, really excited. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Bye. Yep. Bye. That's all we got for you this week. Uh, thanks for listening to Hacker Slacker. And if me and Andre survive our midterms, we'll see you next week. See you next week.